Hey everybody, it's Jay Webb from the Jay David Group. If you don't already know, my company helps software companies find the best software salespeople. So if you're looking to hire, go to the jdavidgroup.com forward slash hiring. Or if you're looking for your next big challenge, go to the jdavidgroup forward slash looking. Uh, also, if you haven't already checked out, make sure you go to my uh, podcast on Apple, Google, Spotify, or Stitcher, wherever you get your podcasts. Over Quota is where I interview founders, CEOs, and sales leaders about the difference between the best salespeople that they've managed over the years um, from everybody else. So make sure you check that out. It's called Over Quota, and don't forget to rate, review, and describe. I'm sorry, not describe, subscribe. Um, so today, I wanted to do a different break format a bit and do an interview with somebody that I've known for many years and talk to him about what people are starting to question, right? In terms of where, where does my future lie? Like what's going to happen with my position? What's happening at my company that I don't already know? What's going to be happen, happening that isn't so apparent now? And so I wanted to bring on someone who can help me answer all of these questions and hopefully you can get something out of this as well. So his name's Jonathan Maeda. Uh, he's the founder of CEO Raider, which is a crowdsource platform that helps customers, employees, and investors anonymously rate and review their CEOs and companies. So go to ceorader.com to find out more about him. He also publishes Tech Today, that's T-E-K, the number two, and then D-A-Y, so Tech Today, uh, which covers trends around capital markets, corporate governance, and technology trends. And before all that, he was an equity research analyst and also led an M&A group at a small mid-cap company, or I should say a mid-cap company. So check that out. Um, but nevertheless, I'm going to do, show you the interview that I did with uh, Jonathan Maeda, who will talk a lot about what we can expect during these times and how decision makers are making their decisions to, um, whether it's to start laying people off or to, you know, to continue business as usual, which clearly is not going to happen. So anyways, I hope you get a lot out of it and, and, um, and thank you again, don't forget to subscribe to this channel and the over quota podcast for more. All right. Thank you. So one of the things, Jonathan, that I'm most curious about, and I'm glad we're having this conversation today is you know, obviously my focus is on technology companies that are hiring salespeople, right? Sales leaders um, all throughout their organization. And obviously with this COVID-19 um, disrupting our lives and disrupting the businesses for which I'm recruiting, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty and things are frankly just up in the air. Um, as you know, someone with your depth, depth of experience in covering the, this market and working with these technology companies, um, talk to me. What uh, talk to me a little bit about you know what we can expect going forward now as we enter this new world? Hey, Jay, good to be with you this morning. Um, so initially, when when the COVID outbreak hit. It felt like the SARS outbreak, if you remember that, back in 2003. Mm -hmm. And then quickly COVID ramped up and it became much bigger than SARS. And, and now the, the, the best comp, as I think about it, is the, the Great Recession of 2008, which initially started with a credit crunch and you know banks wouldn't lend, companies froze hiring. And it was a, a pretty deep retrench. And so what would happen was, you know, at that time I was uh, covering the software industry as an equity research analyst uh, with a, an investment bank called Needham and Company. And for the most part, the, the companies that I was covering at that time were sort of ranged between 100, couple hundred million of revenue up to a billion or so. And a lot of those companies on the software side saw sales decline about 10% at the trough. So it, it wasn't quite as pronounced as we, what you saw with a number of the services and IT consulting companies, where particularly with the smaller ones, and I define smaller as sort of a, a billion in revenue and below, uh, many of those smaller companies saw a decline in revenue of, of 30, as much as 30%. So quite steep. And so what, what a lot of those companies did 
and now I'm thinking more about uh, the, you know, the software companies in particular, uh, much like we're doing today, worked remote. So employees are encouraged to, to work remotely. Um, Non-essential travel was, was halted. Tools like what we're using today to do this video podcast, people started to leverage, you know, remote communications tools, uh, video conferencing, things like this. A lot of companies took that opportunity to remove the bottom performers across different departments. You know, they kind of took a wide swath across all departments and removed, you know, five or 10% of, of, of headcount in many cases. Uh, the sales cycles for sure, elongated and in many cases froze. So a lot of companies, what they did is they, they hunkered down and focused on the install customer base and, and how do we service the heck out of the install base and try to get renewal rates up to mid nineties or, or higher. And to the extent there's an opportunity to upsell the install base, you know, let, let's, let's, let's do so. And as far as, you know, new client, new customer prospects. The focus was on those those prospects that were you know close to the finish line, and sort of tier two, tier three opportunities were just you know gone. Can I ask you a question really quickly, sure. just to, to sort of broaden that out a little bit? Yeah, I'm curious. Um, and uh, just candidly, obviously, you and I know have known each other for quite a while. Uh, my best friend is your brother, and I texted him during this like last week. And I said to him, um, you know, how is this impacting your business? Because he's a vice president of sales at a, at a company that sells um, to the hospitality industry. And he sells to, you know, they sell to hotels and events and all this other stuff. And I said, I was anticipating that there was going to be a bit of a lag, right? And that in, in, in their, in the way that they're seeing things. And he said, not from a, um, I guess, a daily activity type thing. In other words, people are canceling events and, and you know, hotel bookings are down and all that stuff, but just in terms of the bottom line, in terms of the numbers um, that they were seeing. Um, and apparently there isn't a, there wasn't necessarily a lag. It was just sort of happening in real time all at once. And I'm maybe naive to think that, okay, well, as long as I'm recruiting for companies that aren't necessarily um, selling to the hospitality industry or the airlines and these types of things that you see on the news that are immediately impacted, um, then I will be fine because, you know, they're selling, say, a, a like, for instance, I'll get an example of a company that sells application performance management software to, you know, to fortune, say 1000 companies that, you know, maybe in the hotel industry or maybe in the hospitality industry, but they may be in other industries that there aren't necessarily related to the immediate impact. So I guess my question is, is that um, talk to me and other others in terms of what does this look like from a, a supply chain or triple down, so trickle down type of, 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 of thing that really has an effect on everybody, regardless of what the industry is like. Why is that? Why are, why are companies being touched where I might not necessarily assume that they would be directly yeah. affected? So if, if you think about you know, some of those, so whether it's IT services management, application performance management, mm -hmm. um, you know, even some of those deals, which are smaller deals, they're not like the old Oracle and SAP deals from 15, 20 years ago that were you know, several million bucks or double digit million dollar deals, mm -hmm. um, e even those smaller deals will, will slow. And, there, and the reason is because at, at the moment, it's, it's sort of all hands on deck process led by CFOs for the most part, where they're just trying to get their arms around, what does our business look like, mm -hmm. right? So how much of a hit may we take on the top line? To what extent is that gonna require that we recalibrate the various expense line items, particularly headcount. And once we get our arms around that stuff, then we could, you know, move forward with some smaller initiatives. But I, I think that process for, for companies, for CFOs to get clarity around the potential impact of their business, I think that's a, a couple quarter process. You know, I think right now it, it, it's about, you know, keeping employees safe. And that was largely uh, the, the work at home component. And I think that's largely complete. And, and once we, we kind of get employees at home and they're, you know, sort of squared away logistically and they've got their 
the mechanics of their household set up in terms of, you know, organizing the, the, the family situation because folks are going to be home for a prolonged period of time, it sounds like, uh, both uh, adults as well as you know, kids that are in school. Um, once folks are settled in at home, then it's, it, it's all hands on deck in terms of where are we with our customers? So it's scrubbing the pipeline, and that process has already started. But it's going to take a while to, to work through the, the pipeline and identify wh which opportunities are real and which are going to fall by the wayside, which is going to be most of the opportunities. And then again, let's service the, the, the heck out of our install base and make sure our existing customers are thrilled with us because we, at all costs, we don't want to lose any of our existing customer base. We want to keep those renewal rates high. So to work through all that is going to, is going to take some time. And then once companies feel like they've, they've got a handle on that stuff. And again, I feel like that's sort of like a two quarter process. Then maybe they start to move forward with some, you know, sort of what they would define as maybe a, essential initiatives. And so for example, I would think that maybe, um, if companies were in process pre COVID of maybe migrating off of uh, a piece of expensive legacy software and migrating that to the cloud where there was a, a tangible and immediate ROI, uh, those type of projects would move forward because that's a quick and measurable and definitive uh, ROI. You're talking after the, t you're, you're talking in with, you're not talking now, you're talking after they assess. I, I, I think quarters. even those projects get put on hold uh, for, for a period because there is an upfront expense associated with that. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, yeah, so I think in the, in, in the immediate term, I, I think just the, the brakes get put on, on everything. What about, are there mission critical initiatives or applications that technology companies do offer that would continue that you see going forward. And I guess what I mean is you you we're talking about renewals and we're talking about, you know, if a company is selling something that is sticky or ubiquitous or something that just is ingrained within a um, particular organization that removing it would cause a lot more heartache than, than continuing to pay for it. Right. Um, are yeah. there, are there new, um, business opportunities or new applicate or just applications in general that you know of that are m more mission critical and they're not just nice to have, they're actually critical, um, to an operation that companies, and frankly, as a headhunter, I should be focusing on, right? In other words, I should go after those companies that have those mission critical applications that are still needing salespeople to continue to, you know, go after and, and hunt those companies down. Or do you think that's not the case either? Yeah, I think even those opportunities slow down. So the, there's a company. Um, so what's interesting about this downturn, if you look at this, is a couple of different components, right? There's sort of what's going on in the in the markets, and then there's what's going on in the real economy. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in our conversation, we're talking primarily about uh, salaried employees. We're not even talking about uh, hourly employees. You know, we we published a piece earlier this week where you know it, it, it's admittedly a wide range, but we estimated that the impact to hourly employees could be somewhere between 60 and 100 billion in lost wages in this calendar year. And we, we base that estimate off of uh, the wage impact from influenza. And the best guesstimates are that this COVID virus is gonna be roughly 10 times the impact of the influenza. And so that would suggest, you know, 60 to 100 billion in lost wages. And you could check that out. That's a free article we, we posted on our, uh, our Tech Today website, which is the content layer for, for our company CEO Raider. Um, but, you know, in, in terms of mission critical software, so those, I'll, I'll give you an example of one company that I, I, I talk about called SSNC Technologies, which is kind of the space I grew up in many years ago. And what they, what they do is they sell back office and, and middle office uh, software to large asset managers to automate those processes around uh, trade execution, trade settlement, uh, financial reporting, and, and not financial reporting in terms of general ledger, but in terms of um, the reporting that mutual funds 
have to do on a daily basis. So uh, high complexity, uh, highly regulated industry. You can't turn that stuff off to, to save a few dollars. Mm. But to try to get the intention of an asset manager now to uh, look at you know your stuff, I think it would be difficult to even get somebody on the phone uh, in, at, at the moment. But even if you're able to get somebody on the phone in you know in a week or so to to get that that deal to move along, is is just going to be you know exponentially more difficult than it was a, a month ago. So sales cycles even for companies that sell mission critical, you know quote unquote software and related services, you're going to see those sales cycles elongated as well. Mm -hmm. But you see, to your point, there is a difference. You know, whereas the you know discretionary software, like for example, the, the piece of CRM software, you're probably not ramping up hiring of salespeople right now, so you're probably not going to grow your instances of Salesforce.com as an example. Right. Yep, that makes sense. What about again, just as we talk about headcount, <clears throat> as a CFO is looking at his or her organization, and they're looking at, um, frankly, mission critical or more integral um, functions within the organization. Um, where do they start, <laughs> I guess, in terms of, um, you know, trimming uh, down? And is that going to, should we be expecting that like now, like before the end of March, are we gonna start seeing a lot of layoffs? Um, is that going to be the beginning of Q2? When do, no, do they, I think you see it now. I think it's 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 industry specific. So I mean, if you look at the the way stocks have traded, they've sort of traded. You know, they've all come in. You know, for example, in the software industry, many of the software companies have, have come back at the same level. Mm -hmm. um, so the 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 market across industries is, is sort of acting in unison. Um, but as far as how companies behave, that's that's more. Uh, sort of industry specific and company specific. Um, so for example, you know, the airlines, hotels, travel, hospitality, those folks will make cuts now. I think uh, in other industries, you know, software where you won't expect, um, you know, nearly the same negative impact to the top line, you won't see the same type of cuts, but I fully expect companies to, to use COVID as an opportunity to let go you know, the bottom 5% as an example. Mm -hmm. And that will just be, you know, that would be an edict that would come down from the CEO, CFO. And it would just go across departments. You know, it, it may, they, maybe they, you know, each company would be a little different, but maybe, for example, they would say, okay, we have, you know, X number of people supporting this customer. Uh, it's one of our larger customers, but do we really need you know, this number of people supporting this customer, this group has always felt a little bit top heavy. Mm. And, and maybe you use that as an opportunity to right size that customer relationship. So it's going to be sort of company specific, department specific, but I don't expect uh, uh, management teams to focus on one department, let's say. They'll, they'll just take a broad based approach across the company and try to weed out the, the bottom performers. Uh, maybe I, I'm, I'm completely ignorant when it comes to financial speak. So I'll just put that right up front, but I'll just ask this question anyways and say, are there, I, I, as a matter of fact, my mother got me a book a long, long time ago. It was called how to become a CEO. I think the name of it was, it's probably on my bookshelf somewhere back there, but our, what I remember, well, one of the th main things I remember is um, if you want more job security, let's just say, right. And maybe this is uh, trivial, but, to be in what that book called in a line position as opposed to a staff position, or to, or I think it was even to get to a CEO, to become a CEO, you're better off to being a line position, meaning like customer facing front, front line type of um, function as opposed to a staff, which is more supportive and back office type stuff. I guess when it comes to cutting, are, what are, are there, is there um, any analysis around that that we should be thinking of and expecting um, going forward as CFOs make the decisions or how should they be making the decisions based on that? I think that's company specific. I think that it's, um, so you're probably not gonna be ramping up hiring on the marketing side at the moment. Mm -hmm. You know, if we're talking about uh, technology companies, broadly defined. But um, you, you're probably not going to be 
cutting staff on the engineering side, mm-hmm. right? I mean, it's ultra competitive as it is, you know, if you're never mind a startup company, but even a mid-sized company, you're competing with, you know, the, the large platform guys, the Microsoft, Google, Facebook, and all these folks who also are uh, starved for engineers as those companies ramp up their uh, cloud efforts. And so it, it, it's hard enough to, to recruit high quality engineers. So I, I don't expect you to see uh, engineers on the street, hmm. let's say. Okay. So I would expect it to be more around um, sales and marketing functions, given that there's just not going to be a, a, a ton of new uh, bookings activity with brand new prospects as companies try to figure out, you know, where, where, where things sit through, through this period of uncertainty. Before we hit record, we were talking about um, the difference, you know, some of the similarities uh, with 2008. And we talked about it, obviously, during this podcast, but go back and tell me about sort of the levels that they were operating at, um, you know, from efficiency pr- perspective and, and, and where they are and where they were after 2008 in terms of and why that why that was. Remember us talking about that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, I think just 2008, pre-2008, that downturn, there's, you know, a lot of companies were fat and happy. And so um, I think what a lot of companies did, and I'm thinking back to my own experience, I'm thinking back to you know, a number of the companies that I covered, mm-hmm. um, but just common sense stuff, right? Non-essential travel. So if it's, if it's an existing customer and, and you don't need to get on a plane to go visit them to win a deal, whether it's a sales deal, uh, you know, an, an M&A deal, if it was just sort of a more of a, a a maintenance type of uh, interaction that needed to be had. You do that stuff like you and I are doing it. You know, so, so video conferencing, more companies leverage video conferencing versus, you know, hopping on a plane as an example. Um, so I think it was just, it was, it was stuff like that. It was think twice before you spend the money to travel was sort of the, the you know, the big expense that I remember. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I remember a number of companies leveraging, as I mentioned, leveraging tools like, like we're using, where I feel today uh, tools like, like Zoom are ubiquitous and most everybody's using them. I think back then those tools weren't necessarily u- ubiquitous within the organization, video conferencing. And to the extent that companies had uh, you know, licensed a, a video conferencing tool, didn't mean they were using it either. Right. So I, I think technology was the big lever uh, that that companies, you know, leveraged during the during the downturn to try to you know drive operating efficiency. And then there was a fair amount in the way of headcount reductions. And I, I, I don't think even if COVID has a similar impact on the economy as as what we saw in 2008, I just I, I don't think you know, speaking within uh, the confines of, of broadly defined technology, uh, software services and such, I, I, I don't expect those industries to suffer similar headcount reductions as compared to what happened in 2008, because I think a lot of companies kept the good habits formed during the 2008, 2010 downturn and never got back to really the old bad habits so I don't think there's as much opportunity now to squeeze and to drive leverage the operating efficiency out of businesses today as there were as there was 12 years ago. And one of those one of those ha- one of those bad habits is 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 to your point right being fat and happy maybe having um, a few too many heads within a particular department that weren't necessarily needed uh, and now since then they've been able to run more efficiently which means that you know where before pre-2008 let's just say where there may have been 10 people doing a particular function post-2008 now there's five people doing a particular function so the percentage of headcount um drop so to speak will be less because they're not as fat as they were before is that what you're saying yeah i think that's that's a that's a fair assessment um I think in some cases it was being smarter about relationships as well. Mm. I, I remember a lot of, uh, you know, just thinking back to the, to the banking industry, a lot of the expensive dinners and things like this. Whereas 
at the end of the day, is that really driving value? I found that many entrepreneurs preferred that, you know, rather than me take them out to dinner, it was, why don't you come by, see the business, we'll walk you through the product, we'll show you the new software rollout, this type of thing. Hmm. Uh, and, and, and that was more important to them than being taken out to dinner anyway. Right. right? So it was a, a, a win-win for, you know, the, the service provider on the P&L side. And then for the, for the client, they feel like they got something out of the service provider. Mm-hmm. Uh, a service provider was more knowledgeable about their business. What can we learn about um, coming back out of 2008 or frankly, going through all of that between 2008 and 2010, um, I guess, as, as, as we, I guess, prepare for what's still to come, but then also um, what will be on the other side? You know, it's a good question, Jay. I think, um, so we just put out a piece yesterday entitled uh, Battle-Tested CEOs. Mm. And that was specific to the software industry. And these were companies that are around today that are led by CEOs who were CEO uh, during the 2008 downturn. And so I, I think uh, companies that live through the 2008 downturn um, have the benefit of that experience. Um, I, th- I think the downturn, as I mentioned a moment ago, it really helped drive uh, remote working and how to be productive while working remotely. Um, so I think as a lot of companies during this COVID virus push more workers home I think that won't be as big as an, of an adjustment as, as it was 12 years ago. Um, I will be interested on the, the earnings calls for the March quarter. And it may be, I don't know, it may be too early. Those calls will start middle third week of April, but I'll be curious for the companies that live through it. Where you, particularly where you had the same CEO in 2008, as you do today, if those CEOs feel quite comfortable going what they're going through today and they know exactly what steps they're going to take. And the question will be, do they, particularly if they're in leadership positions, do they ramp up spending, uh, particularly on the R and D side? So do they say, Hey, this is an opportunity. We're all going to take a little hit. I've lived through it. The management teams lived through it. We know exactly what steps we're going to take to to mitigate the impact of COVID because it feels a lot like 2008. And I think we have an opportunity to sort of recalibrate our capital allocation strategy and allocate more capital to product development. And we could use COVID as an opportunity to distance ourselves in terms of our product portfolio, user experience, and increase our competitive lead, increase our competitive differentiation versus our peer group. So I'm going to be very curious to see if, if any companies you know, use this as an opportunity to, to create some distance versus the peer group. Is there any precedent to that? In other words, did you see companies during that time that we, that we might know of that, or maybe that you, you just know of that did take advantage of? Uh, or I, you know, I don't remember an instance off the top of my head, Jay. I do, I do recall that uh, some of the larger guys, if you think about companies like FIS, uh, which is a, Mm-hmm. The financial, the, the fintech provider based in Florida. Mm-hmm. Um, I, re, I remember certain companies not cutting quite as much, but I, I don't remember any company getting on an earnings call and explicitly saying, hey, we're going to, you know, to, to, to ramp up spending. And uh, even if they were doing it, I just don't remember people calling it out. Mm-hmm. Now, what, what was interesting, it was just, I wanted, it was either Sunday or Monday, uh, it was an article in the, in the Wall Street Journal that uh, some of the venture groups were saying that, hey, we may use this opportunity to, with some of our portfolio companies, presumably the larger portfolio companies, uh, may use this opportunity to ramp up spending, hire more engineers, and try to you know, g- gain a lead on our, on our competition. Yeah, and that sort of dovetails back to what you were saying before in terms of the critical hires of the people that <clears throat> excuse me not be might not be as affected as uh, as the others is our engineers um and i wonder do you think that um they would be able to 
if, if folks aren't necessarily getting rid of their engineers or, or decreasing their headcount, then I guess this wouldn't necessarily be uh, the case. But if they do start to get rid of some engineers and other people are more are looking at it more of an opportunity um, to increase their R&D and that type of thing, uh, do you think folks can um, start winning that talent, for ba that, that battle for talent? In other words, maybe even getting an engineer that used to be 150 grand or is, is now, say, 125 or even, even less? I, I, I wouldn't expect uh, compensation packages mm -hmm. to be reduced for engineers. Mm -hmm. I, I could envision some engineers hitting the street as uh, smaller companies in a weaker position with a weaker balance sheet who may just not have a choice and they just have to cut heads dramatically or, or go out of business. Mm -hmm. um, and there will be a number of companies that will file for bankruptcy. Um, so there will be some talent on the street, but I, I, I don't think that company is going to have much, much leverage in, in, in terms of being able to get engineers at a 10 or 20% discount. Let me ask you this from a candidate's perspective, someone who might be right now get ramping up the, and started looking for a job and maybe they have to, right? Maybe, maybe they, maybe in, in those who, who aren't now, maybe they will be soon because they'll, 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 they'll be laid off. Um, what should they be looking for in terms of if they're not an engineer, like, was, and maybe there's no answer to this necessarily, but like, are there certain, you mentioned FinTech, are there certain um, industries or um, products or those types of things that folks should be thinking about? Like, here's where the, because all of us, I think, have to find an opportunity somewhere in this. Otherwise, we just, we may not get through this, right? Um so as they're looking for their own opportunities individually, like what should they be doing? Why should they be thinking about their decision um, if their talent and their function can go across industries, if you will? Yeah, so I, I think technology will, will bounce back first. I think that's a great pl pl place to look at, you know, and I have a saying that all companies are, technolo are technology companies today because everybody's utilizing technology to, to one degree or another. Mm -hmm. um, but if, if, if you think about, um, software companies you know, but across sub-verticals, right? Whether it's FinTech, information services, application software, infrastructure software. I just think there's, there's such demand for talent, particularly on the, the software developer engineering side, software architects. I think those folks are in a, are in a great spot. Um, I, I, I do think it's sort of a temporary pause in terms of sales and marketing, because I do think uh, there will be a number of companies, particularly those in a leadership position, that will will want to, uh, not in the immediate term, but probably back half of this year, maybe ramp up sales and marketing a, a bit and try to step on the throats of their of their competitors. Um, CFOs have been in demand. A number of uh, CFO friends I have, uh, I haven't talked to anybody about this in the past couple of weeks, I assume it's changed, but I know CFOs are in great demand. Um, you know, in months, in months past, there's always demand for, for, for good CFOs. Um, so I, I just think technology is probably as, as good a place as any to, to look. And I just feel like big bubbles get bigger. You know, we've sort of written about this at, at tech today where it just feels like the, the Googles of the world, Amazon, Facebook, Microsoft, companies like this are sort of just sucking all the oxygen out of the room. And particularly in the case of, of Google, Microsoft, and, and Amazon uh, with AWS in the case of Amazon, Azure in the case of Microsoft, and, and GCP in the case of Google, those are the respective cloud offerings of each. There's such demand for cloud because cloud is, it's not just remote servers like it was a few years ago. Now they're embedding all sorts of ancillary services into their cloud offerings, whether it be broadly defined artificial intelligence, uh, which requires a, a ton of people um, on, the, on, the, on the engineering side. Um, so I, I would gravitate if I were advising employees, regardless of their field of expertise, their whatever their discipline may be, try to focus on the technology industry. Uh, within technology, I'm, I'm partial to software. I think they'll be the most resistant to this COVID virus. And uh, within software, to the extent folks have flexibility in terms of where they live and such, try to focus on 
market leaders because those leaders I think will will hire disproportionately and will end up winning the day. And so they'll have the they'll take the the lion's share of growth in the industry, the lion's share of profitability. And so you want to sort of attach yourself to to leaders to the extent that you can do so. Fantastic. And one other thing that I'll mention too before we before we wrap up is something you and I talked off a little bit offline. You sort of alluded to it. And I, a little light bulb went off in, in my head as well, which is, is that this vacuum that is, has been left because there are no sports, right? There's no NCAA, there's no NBA, there's no, there's no anything, right? There's a vacuum um, that, is, that is ready to be filled by content and content yeah. providers. And, you know, obviously this podcast is a, in, 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 in video is a, an example of that. And how I'm going to do it and, and use it um, for, for my business is that in this void, in this vacuum that it has been left by uh, by the lack of sports and the lack of, frankly, events that are happening around around this country and around the world is to, even though as a headhunter thing, business slows down and companies are going to not hire as much and, and all that stuff. I want to make sure that when we do come out of this, um, that my brand is the first brand is the brand that they are thinking of that's that's top of mind um when they are ready to hire um and and, and come out of this and frankly doing even all even through all this to still remain relevant and to still um, stay present um, which is why i'm personally going to be ramping up on um, my own podcast um over quota to um, provide people with with information that you're sharing here today, uh, but then also just more information and give people a really, let them know that I'm here from them, not just to, because I want to help them um, and make money by either placing them with the company or helping them uh, hire people, but just really giving them insights that, you're, that you've shared here um, today um, to just help them make better decisions, um, the tough decisions that we're all going to have to make um, to go forward. Um, so I want to certainly thank you for, for sharing all this information with me um, and um, in my audience. Yeah, Jay, I think you, you're welcome. Thanks for having me on. I enjoyed it. Uh, but but I, I think you're 100% right on on podcasts and, and, and we're doing the same thing. I think podcasts are a great way to build your brand, uh, hugely efficient. Uh, as you know, podcast growth is sort of exponential. Um, I think video podcasts in particular are, you know, they strike a chord with sort of the 18 to 35 demo. Uh, YouTube is the social network that's capturing the most growth amongst all platforms with the 18 to 35 demo. So uh, video podcasts are going to be, you're going to see us at CEO Rare to do, do more of the same. And if you just, there were a couple deals recently now, uh, don't quote me on the first one. So uh, the ringer, the, family of sports podcasts founded by Bill Simmons. They just sold to, to Spotify a couple of weeks ago and a, a number wasn't disclosed, but I think it was Bloomberg made a report that the number was a $200 million range. And they had a family of, I want to say about 30, 32 podcasts. There was another deal about a month ago with uh, Barstool Sports sold, I think it was 36% of themselves for 163 million valuing the company at 450 million. They sold to a portion of the company to Penn National Gaming. And in the case of Barstool, there's a little more color. They roughly 55% of their revenue is from advertising. And they'll tell you that most of their advertising, uh, the, the, the interest with the ad buyers came as a result of, of their podcasts. And, and so I think it makes a lot of sense. That's something to the extent that uh, when I advise companies, I try to get the the senior management teams, CEOs in particular, to um, dedicate some time each month to a, a video podcast. It's a great way to connect with clients. I think uh, David Solomon, who's the CEO at Goldman Sachs, takes the time to post a, a video with, with um, him interacting with clients and, and makes that public and front facing on the on the home landing page for, for Goldman. And he does that, I want to say, at least once a month. And so I think it's a great way to sort of build a brand, create brand recognition and to, uh, you know, frankly, create a sustainable competitive advantage versus your competitors.
Yeah, and it absolutely humanizes you too um, for your for your customers as well, especially for all you service providers out there as well. It's extremely difficult, obviously, to differentiate your your service um, and say that we do it better because right. It's just one of those things, right? Like we work harder, we have better day, whatever, right? But in, in w- with software, it's easily it's demonstrable, so you can just show them, hey. You know, here's mine, here's theirs, right? It's just kind of like the old, you know, Tide commercials or something like that, right? The leader, the leading brand versus us, right? You can just clearly see these things, right? Now the sheet is cleaner, right? In this case, it's about sort of, um, you know, if you're able to to build your 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 brand, um, and that Goldman Sachs is a perfect example. I mean, obviously everybody knows that name, um, Goldman Sachs, um, but if that CEO is doing it, then there's no reason in the world why other people, um, certainly much smaller, shouldn't be doing that as well. Yeah, I agree. It makes perfect sense. Awesome. All right, everybody. Well, Jonathan Maeda of Tech Today, that's T-E-K, the number two, D-A-Y. Am I correct? That's correct. Fantastic. And I'm Jason Webb from Overquota. Thank you, everybody. Be well. Be well. All right. Bye-bye.